so pleased to be able to sponsor this event. Today we're going to learn about Tallahassee. I know you think you know because many of you have watched it grow. You've been here. I am not a native. I'm from right next door. I was paying attention though. I'm from Quincy. So I'm from the area. And I know somebody in this room knows that this county came out of Gadsden County. So they're going to tell you that because they told me. I didn't know. So without further delay, we're going to go ahead and move our program. So we're going to talk today in this series, this first um, other series, Tallahassee First 100 Years. Mary Catherine May is going to be presenting first. She's a native of Florida. She's lived in Tallahassee since 1967. She received her Bachelor's of Science in Social Studies Education and a Master's in Social Sciences from Florida State University. Mary was a social studies teacher at Rickards High School from 1970 to 1978. I sound like I hear some of her students in the room. All right. And at Florida State University School, Florida High, from 1979 until her retirement in 2000. She's written books. She's done some work on World War II. She's currently working on a book about World War I. And let me tell you, she is excited about history. Let's give this young lady, as she springs to the stage, a big round of applause. <laughs> I'm very pleased to be here to showcase a little history of Tallahassee during its first 100 years. I'm going to take a brief glimpse at some of the highlights of the town as it grew and developed from 19, 1824 to 1924. I call it Tallahassee, the first 100 years, and I've divided it into four parts in chronological order of history. Part one, the antebellum era, before the Civil War. Part two, the Gilded Age, after the Civil War. Part three, into the 20th century, the last quarter that we'll be looking at, up to 1924. Now, part four is a yesterday and today. We're going to look back at what Tallahassee looked like in certain areas of town in the past and what it looks like today. Okay, all the photos and uh, maps and so forth are from the State of Florida Archives. Part one, antebellum Tallahassee. 1824, Tallahassee and Leon County are established. And as she said, out of the eastern part of Gadsden County, they have placed this little town in the wilderness of North Florida, if you please. And of course, the territorial government met here in 1824. And since there were no buildings no, uh, already here, they had little log cabins built so that the government could function even without a building. This is an early plan for the city of Tallahassee, about 1826. You see that the streets have been laid out, the squares have been laid out, all of them named for military heroes and Revolutionary War heroes and for Andrew Jackson's buddies and so forth. The map shows the city from the north at Jefferson Street to the south about Madison Street, east at Calhoun Street, and west to Duval Street. Now that's how large your capital city was at that time. Wow. Sector E, right in the center, is where the capital is located and that's going to be the main business section of town. That's from uh, Pensacola Street to north to what's going to be Call Street later on, uh, Monroe Street, Adams Street, and that's where the government will, of the state will take place. Okie dokie, you gotta have somewhere to stay when you come to Tallahassee. And Brown's Inn was one of the very first hotels that were available to visitors and even residents at the beginning. Brown's Inn, located at Adams and Pensacola Street. Today that area is under the Capitol. This is a view of Jefferson Street in 1839. You imagine that you're standing on Adams Street looking directly east down Jefferson Street toward the public well where most people got their water at the beginning in Washington Square, if you can imagine that. Now you know that uh, Tallahassee Leon County was a plantation society based on the labor of black slaves. 
uh, the profits from the cotton generated great wealth for the planters and the merchants. Two examples of plantation homes, Goodwood, that most of you are familiar with, and Orchard Pond out at Lake Jackson. Goodwood had about 1,700 acres and only 58 slaves. Orchard Pond had 9,000 acres of land, about 1,000 under cultivation, and in 1860 had 118 slaves. Leon County Courthouse. By 1840, in Courthouse Square, which was between Monroe and Adams Street on the north side of McCarty Street, which today we call Park Avenue. The Union Bank, Florida's first bank, located between Monroe and Adams, almost on uh, the west side of Adams, near McCarty Street. Some of you know where this is today, too, on Appalachia Parkway. Okay. Three churches by 1840. The first one, the Presbyterian Church that we see here, and the historical marker that indicates that the slave galleries were still in the church. Remember that in those days, the slaves were allowed to come into town on Sunday morning and do a little shopping on their own, and then they would go to church in one of these churches. St. John's Episcopal Church. This is the original building located where it still is today. It's going to burn in 1879. And then we have the Trinity Methodist Church, also built by 1840. The second state capital, used between about 1836 and 1839, 40, 45, never quite finished, it did replace the log cabins. It was never quite large enough, but that's all right because by 1845, Florida entered the Union and with statehood got a new state capital. This is a photo of the capital, by the way, in about 1870. The West Florida Seminary. Some of these photos are grainy, so I hope you can see them. Uh, the forerunner of Florida State University and a couple of the little cadets that went to school there. 1861. The Florida legislature votes to secede from the United States after only 15 years in the Union and join the Southern Confederacy of States, and thus we have the Civil War. As you know, four long years of bloody fighting. Finally, the war ends, and in May of 1865, Union General Edward McCook and his Union troops come into Tallahassee, Tallahassee, and Florida surrenders right here in this town. And ultimately, these men raise the stars and stripes over the state capitol and free 9,000 black Leon County slaves. That's 9,000 out of a total population of 12,000. During the Reconstruction era that followed, Black males aged 21 and above were allowed to vote. They were allowed to run for office, and in Tallahassee, they did. And for the next 20 years, Tallahassee and Leon County counted among its representatives in the city and in the county and in the state a large number of black political officials that I hope Diane will someday let me tell you all about, too. <laughs> Part three, the Gilded Age, from about 1865 to about 1900. Uh, many of you have seen this picture. It's an illustration. It's called the Bird's Eye View of Tallahassee in about 1885. If you look down at the lower corner, that's the capital. That'll give you perspective for what is above it there. Let's take a look at four views of Monroe Street in the Gilded Age. You're looking north on Monroe from about Clinton Street, which today is College Avenue, of course. And here you're looking at some buildings on the west side of Monroe Street. The Leon Saloon, a favorite watering hole for locals. Again, at Monroe and Clinton. 
and Kemper's Livery Stable, Monroe between Call and uh, McCarty. You can see the St. John's Episcopal Church over in the left background there. Okay, Tallahassee was ready for some new government buildings. And so in 1883, they got a brand new Leon County Courthouse. Is there a bell in that tower to ring? No, uh, there wasn't a bell. A lot of people wanted there to be a sort of a rooster's, what do you call it, a walk up there where you could look out it and see the great rolling hills of Leon, Tallahassee and Leon County. Uh, but no, no, but it was an elegant building. I do have a description of the interior as well. But now this, don't forget, is in Washington Square. We had a Leon County Jail up here on McCarty Street or Park Avenue, but 1883, we get a new jail built on East Gaines Street. We get the very first United States courthouse and post office in 1893 on the southwest corner of Adams and McCarty or Park Avenue. And everybody wanted more tourism. Everybody wanted the tourists that went to Jacksonville to come to Tallahassee. It was hard to get here because the only way you could get here was by train or by very poor roads or down the Apalachicola River by a riverboat from Eufaula, Alabama. But they kept hoping that maybe if we build new accommodations, they will come. So we have the old city hotel remodeled, the new St. James Hotel on the corner of Monroe and Jefferson, later called the Bloxham after the governor, and the very elegant Leon Hotel in Old Courthouse Square on Park Avenue. Three banks by 1890. The Lewis and Sons Bank, First National Savings Bank, and George Saxon's Capital City Bank. In fact, at that particular time, Tallahassee was sort of the center of financial uh, transactions in the state of Florida. Two schools for the freedmen. I won't go into the history of it. But suffice it to say that the top school is Lincoln Academy, built at the top of Copeland and Park Avenue, and the Florida State Normal and Industrial School, which was also located there, but by 1906 had moved to the top of this high hill south of the Capitol. For a short time, Tallahassee had a street railway. It ran all the way from the railroad tracks, the depot, all the way up Monroe Street, all the way to Brevard Street and back several times a day, and people loved it. And you shoppers could buy your fresh freshly butchered meat and vegetables at the city market house, which was not the most sanitary of places <laughs> in the first place. Uh, or you could shop in the wagons that sort of hung out under the trees. Uh, no ice, no refrigeration, certainly no air conditioning. You can imagine what the meat looked like as it hung there <clears throat> without any of those accommodations. <laughs> So the city built a new city market on the corner of Jefferson and Adams Street. And you see that big round thing in the background, poking up in the background. That was a water tower. They called it a pipe stand. It was the water tower for Tallahassee's very first water works system. Okay, for entertainment, we go to Galley's Hall, later called the Monroe Opera House where they featured traveling shows and local events were held there as well. Part three, into the 20th century. You're looking at Monroe Street during the inaugural parade of Governor William Sh Sherman Jennings, 1901. Mr. Jennings is ultimately going to be able to take his place in the Florida State Capitol, which was remodeled in 1902, at first lighted by gas. You'll go into the old Capitol today, you see the fixtures that were set up there for gas, but within a month after the Capitol had opened, they had electricity, so then it was altered to be electricity. The first governor's mansion. For 60 years, people have been begging for a mansion, a house that the governor could use exclusively for himself and his family. Finally, in 1906, it happens. 
North Adams and Brevard Street. Napoleon Broward was the first one to live there. Looking east on Jefferson at Adams in about 1910, Again, imagine that you're standing on Adams Street looking directly east down Jefferson Street in about 1910. This is what you would have seen. You've got the old galleys hall on the left, the courthouse in the middle, and the market house on the right. Notice the utility poles too. Educational institutions. Tallahassee was no laggard when it came to educational institutions. This is the graduating class of the Florida State Normal Industrial School, the precursor of FAMU in 1904. Florida State College for Women, no longer is the seminary, now it's for women, 1909. Leon High School opens on Park Avenue, which was changed from McCarty Street to Park Avenue in 1906. And by the way, now don't forget, that was right about where we're located today and Leon's first football team in 1917. Okay, 1920, you're looking at Monroe Street from about Jefferson Street, looking north, and please notice the cars, the new automobiles on one side of the street, and the horses are still on the other side of the street. We were going through an industrial change somewhat on the order that we're going through today. By 1920, the market house housed the city hall and the fire department. If you look over here on the right, you can see the wagons for the fire department. 1924, a new Leon County courthouse. It only took them three years to figure out they needed one. And it is built, finished just in time for you know what, the centennial celebration of Tallahassee and Leon County. This is a photograph of a card that went out to everybody that the city could find to give it to on trains, in stores. They mailed them, come to Tallahassee for the centennial. And folks did come. Crowds gathered along Monroe Street to watch the centennial parade. You recognize the Capitol there. Florida State College for Women, ladies, students, whatever you want to call them, in the Tallahassee girl float. And special celebrations in a segregated town, don't forget. Special celebrations by the African American residents with their own flyer, their own invitation, and a dance group from FAMC and the names of these people are on this photograph, but I did not record them. Girl Scouts romping on a replica of the first state capital. And Miss Evelyn Welch is crowned the queen of the centennial. Now let's just have a little fun. No test on this part. <coughs> Yesterday and today, Courthouse Square on Park Avenue 1924, the Leon Hotel. The same place today, and I think you'll recognize it. The U.S. Courthouse and Post Office, about 1910, at the southeast corner of Adams and Park. By 1970, it was the Hilton Hotel. Today, it's the Doubletree Hotel. But you get the idea of where it was located. Monroe Street between Park and Call in 1890. There's Kemper's old livery stable again. Today, the Tennyson condos and the Monroe Park Towers. In the background, you can still see the St. John's Episcopal Church. Looking north at Monroe Street in 1890, you see the courthouse there, so you know where you're looking from. That same scene today. Monroe Street looking southwest toward the Capitol. You see the Capitol Dome there in about 1903. And the way it looks in 1995, and still looks very much like that today, toward two capitals. I like this one. You're looking here west on Jefferson Street, across Adams Street, uh, the old Houston uh, livery stable. Also at one time City Hall and Market House and a variety of other uses. Today, 
1987, excuse me. There are no recent photographs. You're looking northeast at Jefferson and Adams Street in 1893 and in 1987. Three views east down Jefferson. I just love Jefferson Street views because we've got such a history of photographs. In 1839, same view in 1910, and 1987 during the construction of the courthouse. Some of you will remember when that courthouse was remodeled from top to bottom. Now I want you to imagine that you're standing on the top of the old Capitol and you're looking directly east toward the fields and the houses. Notice the fields are empty, they don't have any trees. You know, in 1910, if you survived, you had a garden in your backyard. Probably had a few cows and chickens too. And trees were not what you needed, so you cut them down. At any rate, over to the right, you see a sort of a curve, the road to Perry, and 1995, Appalachia Parkway. I'm sure you recognize that too. And with that, I will end it and suggest that if you are like to learn more about the history of Tallahassee and Leon County, there are places you can find it. At your libraries, your museums, your genealogical societies, uh, the Panhandle Archaeology Society, lots of public talks and presentations, online photographs from the Florida Memory Project, lots of photographs of Tallahassee and all of Florida, and you can find this distinctive information about the Leon County plantations and the slave schedules for each of those plantations. And with that, I will hush and thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>
some African Americans don't even know about. But it's important. And so I'm going to move to emancipation. We know, we, all of us know about Emancipation Proclamation, right? And we know it was proclaimed by the President Lincoln on January 1, 1863. But there was a celebration that came about that started later. From that time up to now, that celebration still occurs. And a main focus of it is, of course, to go out, celebrate, have picnics, and what have you. But a main focus was a drum beat. There is a 20th of May drum beat. It has a distinction all its own. We are fortunate today to have one of the last, I would say, of about five to seven people who know how to beat that drum, that cadence, and it's in the person of Mr. Hunter Hill. And Hunter is, if, you, if he doesn't mind me saying it, is 83 years old. <laughs> now, one good thing Hunter and he'll share with this, he didn't stop with himself, he passed it on to some of his children, which is great. And we hope to get this drum beat to get the Folk Life Award but we also want to um, have it documented, have it scored, if you know what I mean, get a professional musician to write the score and begin to teach it to the younger children because if the youngest one's 83, you, the others are like in their 90s. So with that, I want Hunter to come up because he's gonna tell us about this hidden culture that's tied to emancipation and what he and his family is still doing in regard to that very significant day. Okay, Hunter. My name is Hunter M. Hill, Jr. I am descendants of Florida slaves. There were 61,000 slaves in Florida. On April the 9th, at 2.15 p.m., Robert E. Lee surrendered at Appomattox Courthouse. General McCook came to Florida from Macon, Georgia in the month of May. On May the 11th, he had a dress rehearsal. And he gave the Union troops a chance to go to the plantations and tell the slaves that on 20th of May, 1865, that they would be freed. Can you imagine slaves in the field working? And you see these United States colored troops coming to tell them something. They had never seen nothing like that before. Now, the place where they were emancipated is still there. The park is still there. That was an event. When he read the Emancipation Proclamation, there was just words to slaves. They didn't know anything about what he said. And they weren't sure about their emancipation. They took two years before they had their first celebration. They had their first celebration at a place called Bull Pond. 2,000 showed up for the celebration. Bull Pond is still there. That's Lake Ella. That's what it had. They organized it and they celebrated. At the end of slavery, they didn't have anything. They couldn't read and they couldn't write. They had some old clothes, brogan shoes, a women had four to five homespun or calico dresses. They had no schools. They had the Freedmen Bureau to help teach them how to read or write. Other than the family, the black church became the 
core of the black community. Now, slavery didn't destroy the family. In slavery, they pressed upon their children to depend on their grandparents, their aunts, their uncles, their cousins, and their honorary relatives. Everybody in the black community was a relative, and they depended on each other for their survival, just like the widow. Black men died 40 years old. The, the, the woman lived 20 years longer. She had the children. So what happened to the widow? The honorary relative took care of the widows. And this was the pattern. When they left Bull Pond, Lake Ella, they moved the celebration to Winthrop Plantation. It was celebrated there for 58 years. After the 58 years, they moved to my grandfather's property. That was 95 years ago. My grandfather was given 60 acres of land by his grandfather. That's where I grew up. We have celebrated the emancipation of Florida slaves, Leon County slaves, for 154 years. That's, that's uh, Leon County, hidden culture. Nobody knows about that. Wow. The 20th of May was the most important day, except Christmas and Easter in the black community. Do you all know anything about the 20th of May celebration in Leon County? What we do, sometimes we have like 300 people there. They don't have to pay for anything. We furnish everything. The Hill family, the Weaven family, the Jefferson family. Now, the drumbeat. The Union soldiers, when they came to Florida, when they got into Tallahassee, they started beating on the drums. And so when they left and they disbanded, they gave the drums to the slaves. And the slaves beat the drums. They have this cadence that they started dedicated to the slaves who were separated 154 years ago, and the drum beat does not change. It's the same beat. <laughs> when I was a boy, I had to go to my grandfather's house so he could teach us how to beat the drums. Every young black male in our community could beat the drums. A whole lot of black female also could beat the drums. I taught my son and my grandson how to beat the drums. And this has been going on for 154 years. In Tallahassee, in Leon County, our hidden culture. I thank you. And now, what I want to say, if you want to hear the drum beat, join us May 20th at Hill's Place or downtown to really hear. I'm going to turn it back over to Commissioner. Thank you so much, Hannah. Thank you, Mr. Hill. You know, I'm having trouble remembering yesterday. But Mr. Hill has taken us from way back when until now. So thank you so much, Mr. Hill, and thank you for uh, spending time with us. And thank you, Ms. Barnes, for going to do the invite. We're going to go quickly to Ms. Gloria Anderson. She's homegrown, and she's very passionate about civil rights. She's a, a civil rights activist. And she was educated here in the Leon County School System at the rural Barrow Hill Elementary in the Buckley area, the junior high school that required her to be bused 20 miles round trip daily to attend a segregated school. She's a graduate of the Old Lincoln High School. She received her bachelor's of um, science degree in public administration, political science and history, and her master's degree in adult and community education from Florida a &M. I am proud to be a, a, considered a friend and, um, and family with uh, Gloria Anderson. So come on, Gloria, and let's round this up.
good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure for me to have been invited to be here. Uh, and thank you all for coming. I'm here to talk about the 20th of May in the Buck Lake area, Monterey, Tuscarina communities. Now, thank you, Hunter. I always love to hear Hunter. Hunter is my cousin, y'all. <laughs> when we were growing up, they told us, my mom and daddy told us, they don't marry nobody in Tuscarina, <laughs> New Zion, St. Peter, my Olive, because you probably be marrying some of your cousins. <laughs> my parents were born 45 years after slavery ended. I was born 82 years after slavery ended. And I was sitting there doing some figuration. My grandparents were born 20, and th 20 to 30 years after slavery ended. And my great-grandparents were born in slavery. I was a little girl when I went to the Trans of May. I guess it was a baby in my mama's arms, but I didn't hear them drums until about I was about five or six years old. Well, you see, I'm one of the young ones. So when I don't know, I got people in my family I can go to. There are two people that I went to get these narratives that I'm about to share with you. The first one was my cousin, Mother Idella Banks Leon. She's 85 years old, member of Tess Tessarina Baptist Church. Mother Idella told me, she told me to tell y'all, <laughs> that she first recalled the celebration when she attended, at, it was at Munry, and Munry was across the street from the Lafayette Oaks place on 90 East on Jacksonville Highway. Now y'all call it Mayhand Drive, but when we were coming up, it was the Jacksonville Highway. She said she was about seven years old. She attended many 20th of May celebrations. She remembered the first location, and then she, she said it was moved to the Munry Graveyard, which was further up the hill on 90 East. The drummers at those 20th of May, she said, were the Colson men. It was Uncle Bubba Colson and his brothers. It was a lot of them Colson boys out there on the Buck Lake Road, and they could beat that drum. And he talked about the women. I just remember Sis Tootie. And since Tootie used to beat the bass drum, that big old drum, and then she beat. And there's something about that beat, and when you hear it, you got to start moving. Because that meant freedom to them. She said, two days before the celebrations began, and this is early in the early 1900s, and probably later, uh, earlier than that, but this is when she remembered. She said, Two days before the celebration, Uncle Bubba Colson and Sis Tootie would start beating the drums. And they would start beating just to let the people know that it's getting time to get ready for the celebration. That means that the women need to start cooking them big old cakes. The men need to start killing them hogs and wringing them chicken necks so they can fry that chicken. They had these old homemade baked cakes Pound cakes. I ain't talking about nothing you go to the store and, and buy, y'all. It wasn't the mix that you go. It was stuff that them women had whooped up in them houses when they heard them drums to beating. It was time to get ready. And this is what Idella said. She said they had a big old black barrel. I don't know y'all know, know nothing about them big old black barrels that they used to have. She said when the men made lemon water, lemon water. It wasn't called lemonade. It was lemon water. And these were not lemons that you brought from, brought from the store. See, back out there in the country, I got cousins right now that have arches of grapefruits and lemons, real big old lemons. So this is what they made the lemonade with. And it was cold, cold, cold. Back in those days, everybody came in to where the location was. On the back of a mule and wagon, y'all, it wasn't no Mercedes. It wasn't no trucks. It was their mule and wagon. And what they did, they set up the food on the back of the wagons. Those things meant so much to us. And when they came in and they set up that food on the back of the wagons, everybody shared, just like 
Hunter said, it, you, there was no charge. It was a celebration and everybody was coming to celebrate. Mother Idella told me that uh, at these celebrations, she said everybody had fun. There was no fussing and fighting and shooting. There was no such thing. Everybody was there for a purpose. When it was time for the celebration on that May 20th day around 3 o'clock, everything got quiet, just like it is in this room right now. Everything got quiet. Nobody was talking because the preacher was there and he said it was time to go inside the church. Let us go inside the church and thank God for giving us our freedom. Thank God for life. And that's what Mother Idella told me. Now, I talked with another cousin of mine in the neighborhood named Deacon Elkin Austin. And he's 90 years old, and he's also a member of Tesserina Primitive Baptist Church. Deacon Austin explained to me how the first celebration was at Monterey at Buckley. Now, there's a story that the Colson men have about how Buckley got his name. Does anybody know? Well, let me tell you, out on 90. They said, you know, back then, there was just roads. There are streets now. He said that Uncle Buck was in his buggy and wagon on this dirt road, right? Just riding along there, you know, just going on down the road. And something spooked the mule. And he got away. He, the, the mule just kept running and running and running and ran in the lake with Uncle Buck. And Uncle Buck drowned. <laughs> Now, they said them coastal men, there was, a, was about 12 or 15 of them coastal men out there on Buck Lake Road, so they ought to know. But they said Uncle Buck drowned, and ever since then, they called the lake Buck Lake. Okay, but anyway, Deacon Austin. Deacon Austin said some of the celebrations were um, celebrated around the 4th of July. And he said when they moved to Munry to the second spot, there were some people who did not go to that second spot, but they came over to, in the Edgewood community, on the Davis property, uh, and they celebrated at the old Santa Rosa prayer house. And they said later they took it back to Testerina. The celebrations continued at Testerina. That's where we went to the, to the uh, 20th of May. I just started going to the hills when the 20th of May over at Testerina shut down. When I was there at the test arena, after that hour of church and the drums started beating, you know it was time for the 20th of May. So that's all I got to say, y'all. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Just listening to these ladies and this gentleman with all of this knowledge, the way to make sure that the history goes forward is that you got to document it and you got to publish it, and we got to preserve it. Our children have no idea. Your children have no idea. I need to ask you to help us go to action. I was aware of the 20th of May. I, I grew up in, in, in Quincy. My aunt Eliza was shared with me some of the celebrations that used to happen in Quincy for the 20th of May. This year we went downtown to, and I've gone downtown many times before. This time I went downtown to the 20th of May and I was very disappointed at the participation. Two buses of folks came from Clearwater, right? Clearwater, St. Pete area, and Pensacola. Had they not been downtown, it would have been a very dismal look. And then I saw later on that others were beginning to do Juneteenth programs and celebrations here in Tallahassee. And so it just really caused my heart to just cringe because we need to embrace our own history. And so I, I encourage you to join us in this effort to make the 20th of May. We want to do what, what Texas did. Texas made Juneteenth a holiday. That's why people remember it. it's a holiday. So we need to make the 20th of May a holiday because we got the word here in Florida first. We're first. So we should celebrate the 20th of May, and make this celebration that we're currently having, these celebrations that we're having, make them bigger, make them more 
noticeable. We are living together. We're learning from each other. We're loving each other. We need to celebrate each other. Yes. Not only uh, the Twins of May, but we need to celebrate other historical um, events here in our, in our city. We're going to ask that the Twins of May become a holiday. Washington, D.C. celebrates this as a holiday. I Googled that this morning. We're, we're a generation of Googlers, so Google it. Uh, to see what other states are celebrating emancipation. I have begun to have brief conversations with our current local delegation of the Florida legislature, and I'm going in closer. But I, want, I invited them to come today, but I don't, I don't think they made it. So when we leave here, we need to go tell it. We not only need to tell our children, we need to tell those who we elect, those who we interact with, that this is a part of our rich history. So we need to join in the celebration. We need to do something to make it permanent. So when we leave the scene, it will continue for another 154 years. We need to make sure of that. So I'm asking you to do what you do. Letters, postcards, phone calls, advocate on behalf of making the Twins of May a celebration that we can all be proud of and can participate in. Can we do that? Yes, we can. That's the correct answer. Can we do that? Will we do that? Thank you. I appreciate that. Now, to talk about where we go, where else we're going, this was the first of a series that we're tossing around. We're open to others wanting to join in this effort. So listen out for future series. We're talking about some subjects, probably maybe some legacy communities or some other, other things of interest that we don't, we don't need to let them be hidden anymore. Thank you all so very, very much. I want to thank my city of Tallahassee family. The uh, city manager was here and Commissioner uh, Bryant was here. And I want to thank my aunt for driving over from Quincy because she doesn't like to drive from Quincy often, but she'll do it for me. Thank you all for being here. You're all VIPs. <laughs>